Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ such a big deal? I mean, Christians talk about it. Easter is this huge celebration. And I'll tell you why. Either the resurrection of Jesus is the pivotal moment in all of history, which should divide history into before Christ and after, or it is the biggest hoax that's ever been perpetrated. I mean that. It is either all or nothing. It's either so important that we should talk about it all the more, or we should feel stupid for having believed a lie. We live in a time when there's all kinds of conspiracy theories and all kinds of people who are saying, this is the truth, and, and a lot of confusion. And I want to go back just a little bit in history and tell you another time that happened. In 1969, the Apollo mission took U.S. astronauts to the moon. I mean, it was a thrilling moment. We watched it on television. If you're my age, you remember that. You, you get to watch it. We talked about it. It was just, it was the buzz. And when Neil Armstrong stepped off that ladder and said, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, there was this surge of national pride and excitement, especially because it had been a race with the Russians all along the way. And it was less than 10 years later when a guy named Bill Casing wrote a book and it was called, We Never Went to the Moon, The $20 Billion Swindle. And he began using some of the things that were evidence from that what we saw in the moon landing. And he, he looked at things like the, the flag and he said, well, it's waving and that's, that's proof that, that this was a movie set, that they never went to the moon at all, that they just filmed it in a Hollywood set and, and the radiation would have killed the astronauts and there wasn't enough moisture on the moon to make these footprints and, and the shadows are wrong. And, and he basically gave this whole scenario saying, that because they couldn't make it to the moon, they created this elaborate hoax. Now, what's disturbing is that they did a poll recently and they found out that 10% of Americans agree. They believe that we never went and walked on the moon, at least not in 1969. And what's interesting is if when you divide it down into generations, if you are 54 or older, there's only 3% of people who don't believe we went to the moon. If you're 18 to 34, 18% of the population the further you get from the point at which something happened, the easier it seems to be to deny it. We have people who deny the Holocaust. We even have people who die, deny the, the September 11th flying into the Twin Towers. And so people have been denying the resurrection. And there are old, old conspiracies and controversies like the one about the moon landing. But there's also some brand new ones. Let me tell you one of my new favorites I've just learned about. It's called Birds Aren't Real. Now, how many of you have heard of this one? Uh, I'm guessing that if you're under 30, you may have. If you're over 30, you probably haven't. And, and the serious statement that's made by this movement is that in the 70s, the U.S. government killed 12 billion birds and replace them with drones. And they go through this whole process of how they are seeing through their eyes. And it's, it's really very, very cleverly disguised drones. And they're spying on us all the time. And, and they're saying this seriously. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we're not being spied on. I'm just saying I think birds are real. But I, but I watched, as a part of my research on this, I watched a, a TV program where a young 24-year-old kid was, was being interviewed. And they're, the older two that were interviewing him were asking him questions. And, and the woman said to him, you're not really saying there are no birds that are real. You're, you're using this as a satirical comment about how we need to be cautious about government spying on us. And, and the, the camera zooms in on this young man who looked so intent. And he said, I find that question offensive. And it's like, wow, he, he believes this. I mean, he's devoted his life to this cause. And, and he's trying to get the, the word out and they're buying billboards and there's t-shirts and there's socks that you can wear. And, and, and you know what struck me about that? Is that a passionate commitment to a lie is a dangerous thing. And then as we talked about the resurrection, I also thought that a casual acceptance of the truth is a dangerous thing. So my desire is to set before you why we believe what we believe and how we know it to be true. Not only that you might come to a shallow belief, a casual belief, but that you might come to a deep, passionate belief in the truth, because that's what is the right thing to do. Let's look at 
why we believe in the moon landing or why I do. Um, one of the articles that I read at, that was written on the 50th year anniversary of the moon landing, uh, he, he made some very good points. He said, there's three reasons that I want to just put out that it actually happened. Number one, let's talk about the evidence. All the film footage, the moon rocks they brought back, all kinds of things. There were tangible evidence in addition to the, to the witness stories that we heard. And then secondly, he said the, the friends that are involved, there were 410,000 people that were involved in making the rocket, involved in launching, and involved in watching. They couldn't have all been duped, and they couldn't have all kept the secret. And then he made a very interesting point, which I think relates to when we're looking at the truth. He said, it, not only is the fact that the friends would have, if they had been lying, they would have spilled the beans, but he said, this was an intense race that if you were alive in that time, you know that Russia would make a jump ahead and send a capsule around the earth, and, and then the U.S. would be able to make another technological jump, and then Russia would send a, an animal around, and it would live, and there were all these sta stages back and forth, and, and kind of the story we were telling ourselves was whoever got to the moon first would be in charge of space, and if the Russians got there, it was going to be dangerous, and, and if we got there, we would save the, the, the universe, kind of, kind of a feel to it. And the point he made out of that is if the U.S. had faked it, Russia would have been all over, trumpeting to the skies all the ways in which it was a fraud. And they were silent, except for keeping their own people from watching it. And so we look at, we look at those evidences, and I, I think it's also kind of funny. It's like if you think it was a movie set, have you seen the movies from, the 69, from 1969 or 1970? I mean, this was before Star Wars made a big jump, and they weren't that convincing. So as you look at those things, I think we can apply some of those same questions to the resurrection. What's the evidence? What do we see about the friends or the disciples in this case? And what was the impact that we see on the enemies or the chief priests and the, the Pharisees, the ones that crucified him? So let's go back and look at what we're talking about here. Jesus was God on trial. That when Jesus was here in the flesh and he was standing before these courts, he was answering for his statement that he was, in fact, the Son of God. And they were trying to decide whether that was true or not. And as you look through that process, he was convicted by the people of the day. Uh, on Palm Sunday, we did a video, and we filmed it, or we showed a video that we had filmed at Douglas County Courthouse. And, and we kind of walked through the parts of the trial of Jesus. And if you haven't watched that, go onto our website and watch it. But he was clearly convicted because... The chief priests and the Pharisees had a wrong idea of what it meant to please God, and because they were jealous of his popularity, Pilate and the Roman government was just trying to keep peace and trying to keep it from a riot happening, and, and they figured one man dying was a, an expediency that they could live with. And then obviously the, the people were manipulated. The, the ones who cried Hosanna on Palm Sunday were, may have been some of the same crowd that cried crucify him less than a week later. Because they were not really interested in the truth. They were each interested in their own personal take on how it was going to affect them. And I want to present to you some evidence. And I want to say you're the jury today. I want you to think this through clearly. And if, if you're already a follower of Jesus, allow this to deepen and enrich your faith. And if you're just kind of kicking the tires and checking it out, I want you to think about this clearly. Because this question about who is Jesus and what did he do? And did he really die? And did he really rise from the dead? And is there some way in which that has impacted all of us for all of eternity? So I'm going to give you some lines of evidence to start with. And the first one that is very convincing, if you understand and begin to do some study on it, is the fact that Jesus fulfilled more than a hundred prophecies that, that ranged from 400 to a thousand years before he came. In fact, Jesus prophesied himself while he was here about some things that were going to happen. And some of them are very, very clear. And some of them are more like brush strokes of an artist, kind of painting a picture of, of this Messiah that would come. And, and it talked about the fact not only that, that he would save his people, but that he talks about he'll give us, he'll take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh and, and give us a relationship with God. And there were some... Uh, maybe differences in exactly how those pictures were seen, but there were some things that were very clear. And even Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, when he sat with his disciples, he said, 
This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So Jesus had this very clear idea that he had to fulfill every single one of those. And I'll tell you, if you do any study at all, you'll find out he not only fulfilled every single one of them, but he's the only one in all of history who ever could. And of course, some people jump on the opposite side right there and say, well, of course, he reads up on the prophecies. He tries to fulfill all of them so he can, you know, declare himself to be the Messiah. Well, let's look at a couple of them. First one, he was born in Bethlehem. Think about it. <laughs> it's pretty difficult to choose where you're going to be born. And if you think about the Christmas story, this wasn't his hometown. It's not where he, believed, he, where he lived. In fact, God moved the whole Roman Empire to be able to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. And then we've talked about some of the pictures that were given of the Messiah, that he rides in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, and that that was a picture of the humble king who was to come from Zechariah 9. And then you look at um, various pictures of how he was going to die. And some of the pictures talked about him being like his bones showing and him hanging. And in fact, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 give perhaps a more emotional description of what Jesus felt on the cross from a thousand years beforehand. And in Psalm 22, he specifically says, and they were gambling for my clothes under my feet. And, and you think, that's exactly what happened. That these callous soldiers with him hung on the cross right above them, they, they saw his, his robe was a, a finely woven robe of one piece. And so instead of tearing it apart, they decided to gamble for who was going to get the whole thing. And I think that's just a small picture of Jesus intentionally fulfilled some prophecies. Absolutely. Some he could not have fulfilled at all. Others, others had to fulfill. In fact, at one point, the disciples say, we realized that we had done these things to him and didn't even realize it, that we were actually part of this prophecy. So if you look at those things of how he was, and in fact, the fact when they are written, Capital punishment in the Jewish nation was stoning, and the Romans brought in crucifix crucifixion much, much later. And yet, that description is in Psalm 22, which is a thousand years before Christ. In Isaiah 53, it says he'll be silent before his attackers, and instead of answering them back or defending himself, he was silent as a, as a lamb before the shears is dumb, is what Isaiah 53 says. And then, perhaps one of the most impacting ones, as I was reading through it, is in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus has been hinting to the disciples and talking to them, and now he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem, and he absolutely lays it out specifically. He said, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be turned over to the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, and then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. I mean, it's quoted exactly. And yet somehow it was an inconvenient truth they didn't want to believe. And yet later on, they came back to remember and go, oh, man, this so much proves that Jesus is God because every single thing that was said about him has come true. One of the reasons that impacts me is there was a guy named Josh McDowell, and he talked about going to college as an atheist. And he had a bunch of Christian friends that kept irritating him. And they were trying to talk to him about Jesus and about how he should entrust his life to Jesus. And, and frankly, he was just mad at him. And so he set out with his pre-law wisdom to, to assign and, and to silence them by showing that the resurrection never happened and that Jesus never really lived. And what he found, in fact, is that Jesus' life is well attested by other sources, other historical sources in the Bible. And the more he looked at the resurrection the more he said it has to be true. And he's the one that walked through some of these prophecies as a clear picture of Jesus fulfilled all of that evidence. And then secondly, we look at Jesus' friends. And the disciples would have been the only ones who could have perpetrated this hoax that Jesus came alive. And, and in fact, they were accused of stealing his body and taking it somewhere else and then proclaiming in fact, that's one of the, the myths that lives today, that in fact, the disciples stole the body and that, that in fact, they knew it was a lie, but they just started a movement because that's what they wanted to do. 
and you read through the Bible, and it's very honest about exactly what was going on. And here's, here's our key Easter morning passage. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. You see, when she saw an empty tomb, her mindset was such not, oh, maybe it's true that he's raised. Her mindset was immediately, Jesus is dead. They've taken his body. They've put it somewhere else. We need to find it. And in fact, that was each of the disciples, Peter and John, as they ran to the tomb. That, that was their assumption, not that they had perpetrated this great snatch and they had taken the body and now they could de declare him to be raised. No, their, their idea was he's dead. In fact, for me, one of the greatest proofs when I look at the resurrection is I look at the disciples beforehand and they were hiding and terrified and denying Christ and, and they were anything but a triumphant band that was going to start a movement. And then after Jesus met with them, and in fact, he ate fish in front of them to show that he wasn't a ghost. And after that, you see this life transformation. They become confident and bold and proclaiming him alive. And in fact, they were willing to die for that belief. Now, people will die for a lie, but they won't die for a lie that they know is a lie. You may start a hoax or a myth or or some kind of a fantasy, but you won't take it to the point where people are going to kill you for it. And so as you look at the friends of Jesus, you realize, man, there was a total transformation in their life. Something happened there. And then we look at the other side, just as we did for the spacewalk, Jesus' enemies. And it's very, very interesting. If you read Matthew 27, it says the next day, the one after the preparation day. So Jesus had been already crucified. He had already been buried. And he was already in the tomb. And then it says, The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, We remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. <laughs> Isn't it ironic that his enemies listened to him and his friends didn't? That Jesus was crystal clear with the disciples and they totally lost it. And the enemies of Jesus, those who had been trying to catch him in some kind of a falsehood, they knew exactly what the prophecy was. And so they said, we need to stop that at all costs. And so they went to Pilate and they got a guard and the guard put a rock in front of the tomb and they put a cord across it and they had live guards standing there around the clock. And you think about the story. And it, the scripture says there was an earthquake and then the stone rolled away and there were angels there. And it says the guards fell down as though dead. And I was thinking about this as we were thinking about this story. Who had the greatest firsthand experience of the resurrection? It was the guards. And yet they chose to disbelieve that truth. In fact, they were just looking out for themselves because you know what happens to guards who fail in their duty? You know, that's usually the end of it. Instead, they ran to the chief priests and the elders and they told them what had happened. And in alarm, they gave them, it says, a great sum of money and say, tell this story that the disciples stole the body and, and that they really, they really, there was no resurrection, that they made it up and now that they're trying to start a movement around that. You know, I think it's exactly the same thing as we talked about in the spacewalk. All the Jewish leaders would have had to do to kill Christianity in its very inception is produce a body. You say Jesus is raised from the dead? Here he is. And boom, it would have been dead. And they couldn't because Jesus was alive. So the enemies of Jesus were a wonderful proof that in fact, that's what happened. And then you look at the resurrection itself. And I've already talked to you about Josh McDowell and his looking and trying to disprove it. And what actually finally happened to him is he found that the resurrection really was credible. And he, in fact, gave his life to Christ. And he, he spent the rest of his time in his life talking about the proofs of Jesus' life and of how he changes us. And it sort of sounds like the Apostle Paul 
In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is dealing with people who even in the first century have already believed the myth that somehow Jesus never raised from the dead. And so look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is vital. This is central. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. He said, there are witnesses out there. You don't believe me? Go and talk to them. And it wasn't just one or two witnesses, and it wasn't just one or two times. He said it was, there were 40 days that Jesus, between his resurrection and the time he went back up into heaven. And then he says, some of them are still living, although some of them have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. The apostle Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. He, he was living in the same time frame, but they, they weren't together in that same place. And yet, Jesus appeared to, to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus trying to imprison Christians and to stop the movement. And Jesus appeared to him and Paul never recovered. He said, I'll tell you why I know it's true, because I saw him. And Paul makes this case that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then none of it's true. In fact, he says it really strongly. He brings up this idea, that this is the term that Josh McDowell used, called the trilemma. And if you have a dilemma, a dilemma, there are two things that you have to choose between. If you have a trilemma, there are three things, and only one of which can be true. And, and he put it out this way, and I thought a very powerful and convincing way for me. He said, if Jesus either was a liar, which means that he said he was God, he said he could take away our sins, he said he came from the Father, and it was all untrue. You see, part of the difficulty is people want to slide away from the hard choice, and they want to say, Jesus is a good man. Jesus was a great moral teacher. He was a, a nonviolent leader, and we can, we can admire him. And I find most people love Jesus, but they don't necessarily want to believe that he really was who he said he was. So he either had to be a liar. He knew he wasn't telling the truth. He just said it. Or he thought he was really God, and that would make him a lunatic. Uh, if somebody comes up to you today and says they are the Son of God and they're going to take away the sins of the world, you're thinking, where did you escape from or where do we need to put you? And, and so that would have been a crazy person, self-deluded. And there are self-deluded messiahs in our present world who think that they're Jesus re reincarnated or Jesus come back. And Josh McDowell said, either that or he has to be the Lord of all. He can't be a good man. He can't be just a good moral teacher. He's a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord of all. Choose one. And that was a, a, power, a powerful piece in my own spiritual journey to come to realize that that had to be a choice that was made. And, and all of the evidence is pointing towards Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he steps it up even stronger than that. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Then those who've fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. He said, if it's not true, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is not true, then we are total fools. We have been taken. This is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated. And then he makes a statement of faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Paul said, if we believe something that's not true, we are complete fools. But it is true. And you know, my observation is it's important for people to be convinced in their head. It's important to get your questions answered, to have an understanding that faith isn't just believing something and making it up. Faith is really understanding the the foundation of the historical facts around the life and the words of Jesus. But then there's another step involved, and that is by committing your heart. It has to move 18 inches. And you have to say, okay, I choose to believe. I choose to submit my life. I, I'm going to put my life in his hands. And I, and I think the question is often not one of historical reality. It's more of one of control. I don't want to give my life to Christ because I like to run things. I want to do my own thing. 
And you know, I, I think the question that we have to answer as you also look through the stories in the scripture is what kind of a savior is he? And you know, that's different than just looking at the facts of a case. What kind of a savior is he? And I read through the story and, and you think of that night in the garden when Judas came to betray him and the, the soldiers are coming with swords and, and torches. And in the dark and confusing part of the night, you know, Peter grabs the sword and, and he's more enthusiastic than skillful and he, he whacks off a guy's ear. And Jesus looks at him and says, down, Peter, down, boy. Don't you think I have enough power here? I could call down 12 legions of angels. I have plenty of things that I could do, Peter. And then he used his power not to destroy the people that were trying to hurt him. He leaned down and he picked up an ear and he took it and he put it back on the, the servant of the high priest, come to find out. And he, he's that kind of a savior. He's the kind of savior that when Peter, in full of his own self-righteousness, when Jesus said all of his disciples would betray him, Peter said, not me, everybody else, but not me. And Jesus looked at him and said, actually, three times tonight before the rooster crows. And, and sure enough, Peter gets challenged three different times while Jesus is on trial. And, and he says, no, I didn't know Jesus. And they say, weren't you his disciple? And I don't know if you caught this fact, but the third person that challenged him was a relative of the guy whose ear he had taken off. And it's like, I know you were there. And Peter began to call down curses on himself and denied it. And right then the rooster crows. And you know, there's this touching moment in the, in the story of the resurrection where Jesus appears to Mary and, and he says, get the disciples together and I want you to, to go and I'll meet you at a certain place. And, and he says it like this, tell the disciples and Peter. Because I think Peter thought he was off the team. You know, he had, he had fouled out. And, and Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> not only are you still somebody that I can use and somebody that, that I love, but in fact, your failure may have made you more usable. Maybe you're now at the end of your own pride. And there's a touching scene later where he meets Peter at the side of the Lake of Galilee. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter has a chance to say, yes, Lord, I love you. Three times for the three times that he denied him. That's the kind of savior he is who understands that we fail and that we deny and, and restores us in love. And then I think also of, of Thomas. And somehow Jesus is appearing after the resurrection and there's a number of appearances and, and he seems to show up. The disciples are still fearful and, and they're hiding in a locked room and all of a sudden Jesus just shows up there. And let me tell you, that would mess with you. You're looking at every shadow, shadow around thinking, is he going to be here and somehow the first time he appeared, Thomas wasn't with him. And so, so the disciples are telling Thomas, he's alive, he's real, we saw him. And, he, and, and, and they're trying to convince Thomas. And Thomas, I don't know if he felt left out or if he just felt angry, or if he was just a very doubtful person. But he said, I am not going to believe unless I can touch my, my hand, my fingers to his wounds, unless I can touch the side where the spear went in. And so it says a few days later, they were all together again in a locked room again and Jesus appears and he says, Thomas, come here. Oh man, I would not have wanted to been Thomas. I mean, all of a sudden you realize what a fool you've been and how you've denied him. And Thomas, Jesus said, come put your fingers here in the holes in my wrists. Come, come put your hand in the side. And it says, Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. And I'm envisioning him at this time. He's, he's face down on the floor. And here's, here's, here's where it gets personal for you and me. It says, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. That's our privilege today. That if you understand what kind of a savior he is, how patient and how loving he is, why would you not, if he's really the son of God and if he's really that kind of a savior, why would you not want to commit your life to him? And I could tell you the story of my life and the story of, 
other people have done that. But let me, let me tell you the story of a young lady I know who's recently given her life to Christ. She grew up in a Christian home. She went to church when she was a kid. She said it was a, it was a nice church, but the people were so judgmental and critical of everybody. And then she said, we moved when I was a junior high, high school kid and, and I went to this little tiny country church that had old people and old style buildings and old style music and everything just seemed old, old, old. And she said, it didn't relate to me. And, and besides all my life, I had been just angry. And as soon as she turned 18, she got out of the home and she started making her own decisions. And, and really her life for the next almost 10 years was a bad decision, bad decision, bad decision. And finally, it turned out that she was driving in a car late at night and she had an accident and she was found to be under the influence and the driver of the other car died. And when she went to jail, she had a long time to think about what being in charge of her own life really looked like. And she had a long time to think about what she had learned as a child and growing up. You know, it was, it was kind of cool that when she bailed out, she found from her family that they were there to love her and support her. And she came to our church and, and found us willing not to brand her a terrible person, but to, to talk to her about Jesus. And she and I met several times and I tried to answer her questions and give her, give her enough evidence that Jesus was indeed real. And then I talked to her about what does it mean to, to believe with your heart and to confess that Jesus is your boss, your Lord. And so I explained that and that we would when she was ready, that I would like to pray with her and I didn't force her because I don't think you can force somebody to a point of genuine belief. And I said, when you're ready, we'll pray together and then we'll get baptized. You'll get baptized because that's what we do when we follow Jesus. And I got this strange text after we'd met together several weeks and she sent me a text and it said, I'm going down. And I thought, what does that mean? So I texted her back and she said, I'm ready to get baptized. And she and her boyfriend came in and they prayed to receive Christ into their life and had the privilege of baptizing him just a few, a few weeks later. And the cool part is to watch her begin to change. You see, it's not just what you know in your head as an intellectual belief. It's what you've experienced in your life. And the anger was gone and her, her humility is there so she can start learning and she's listening to other people and, and she's not condemning others and holding anger and bitterness against them. And it's one more beautiful story of how the resurrection of Jesus has changed somebody's life. And so as we go through this process, I want you to think about the evidence we've talked about, about the kind of Savior Jesus is, and about the literally billions of people who have chosen to believe and to follow him, and it's changed their life. Think about that. Thank you, Paul, so much for that challenging message. I love the challenge he's giving us here. What is your verdict? What is it that you believe? Because what you believe will change the trajectory of your life. I want to talk to two groups of you. For some of you, you're watching this and you have never come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is really the first time you've begun to wrestle with the idea, is he really who he says he is? Is he the son of God? Is he the one who died for our sins? Or is he just some guy from history? Your answer to that is the most critical question you will ever deal with in your life. Here's the one thing you can't do. You can't just put it off. You're going to have to answer this. And I'll tell you this. If you decide to make no answer at all, you've made your decision. You have to surrender your life to Jesus to have this be something that actually changes your life. And for those of you who are already followers of Jesus, I want to give you the same question. How deeply do you believe what you believe is it really in there or is this something that we say, oh, I've crossed the line of faith. I've become a follower of Jesus. And you think that's enough. In actuality, I believe this will continue to transform your life. And in fact, our second question really is for those of you who are believers. What have you experienced? Because here's what I think is critical for your life. When you have become a follower of Jesus, he will put things in your life where you have begun to trust him deeper and deeper. When you remember those and when you put more faith in him because of those, it will spiral and it will begin to catalyze you to a greater life connection with him. I'm going to go ahead and close this with prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the impact um, that your love of your son has made on us. God, I pray first for those of us who are wrestling with the idea of whether or not you really are who you say you are. 
God, I pray that you would inspire us, inspire us to continue the, the searching. Lord, I pray that you would answer the questions, put the right people in the room with those of us who are wrestling. And God, I pray for those who have already become followers. God, I pray that you would deepen our faith, that you would deepen our longing, that you would deepen our connection with you. And God, I pray that the experiences of the things you've already done, God, I pray they would take us into deeper, deeper waters. We love you, Jesus, and in your name we pray. Amen.